Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Danny Hai Fong. Uh, you are tuning into a special evening live streams. I generally stream in the afternoon, but today I am streaming in the evening because I have a very special guest. We are going to talk about the China Initiative and this new McCarthyism that has been sweeping across the United States and the Imperial Corps. And we will talk about the China Initiative in the context of of this new Cold War, this new McCarthyism, which is not simply a matter of China-U.S. relations. It really is a broader global trend. And a lot more people are talking about this now that the United States is really uh, provoking and at the root of this crisis in Ukraine, this Russia-Ukraine conflict, which is ongoing and which cannot be separated from any conversation about China. But nonetheless, we have a lot to get to. So I'm going to bring on a Professor Ken Hammond. Ken Hammond is a professor at New Mexico State University. He's also an organizer with Pivot to Peace and a member of the Party for Socialism and Liberation. Hello, Ken. It is good to be with you today. It's good to be here. Great. Yeah. So let's get started. So the China Initiative, it gets started under the Donald Trump administration and in 2018. And it was allegedly started as a kind of a almost like a counter espionage policy under the Department of Justice and the FBI, where the whole operation was meant to kind of neutralize the so-called Chinese threat to patents and technology, right? Mike Pompeo, over and over again, as Secretary of State, was talking about how China was stealing uh, patents, technology, knowledge, you know, all of this from the United States. Uh, Jeff Sessions was uh, head of the DOJ at the time, uh, Attorney General, and uh, it was he, he who spearheaded this, and it continued all the way for four years. Thousands of cases were put on the books, thousands of cases, and it continued into the Biden era, and it was declared over, right? There was a huge backlash for the, over these past four years from the Asian American community, from academics and researchers who felt that they were being targeted. There was a huge racial profiling component, 90%, I believe it is of those who were uh, indicted or charged and brought uh, under DOJ investigation and FBI investigation were of Chinese American descent or Chinese descent. Uh, so it was, it, it's been a real witch hunt, right? And there's these huge high profile cases, the MIT researcher, uh, Gong Chen, there's uh, uh, Feng Tao, right? We can get into some of these cases as we talk about them, but uh, what has been your reaction to this? I know that you are a professor of, uh, and a lot of your focus is China and a lot of your research is around China. So so uh, how, what, what what is your reaction to this, your experience maybe even, uh, if you have any, speaking with those affected by it? Yeah, well, the, the, the China initiative, um, as you as you just noted, you know, this was a Department of Justice program. And although it has been repackaged, it's still basically operating, um, which ostensibly was intended to blunt the efforts of China to sort of systematically infiltrate uh, people into American uh, institutions of higher education or, or research facilities or things like that, uh, with the nefarious intention of stealing intellectual property, of gaining access to, to critical technologies, um, all of which was, was sort of a fantasy that, uh, that in many ways just inverted uh, America's own history as a as a great stealer of uh, of intellectual property and uh, you know uh, using other people's research and development to to augment American uh, industry uh, we have a long long history of that on our side um, and it as you say it's operated over the last four years uh, it has had a very very spotty at best track record uh, of of prosecutions. 
in the end, uh, uh, or as it has evolved, most of the cases that have been pursued haven't ever demonstrated any actual espionage or any actual transfer of intellectual property, any any vulnerability on the part of American defense or other technological uh, uh, systems. What it came down to in the end, what, what uh, the Justice Department tried to uh, prosecute people for, were things like not making the clearest possible declaration of the institutional affiliations of the university that you studied at or that you had taught at or that you were a researcher for back in China. And the, the, you, you see in a number of these cases allegations that, well, so-and-so didn't report their, their connections to the, to the People's Liberation Army. And what that gets based on is the idea that they, they noted their relationship with a particular university, but they didn't specify that that university itself had a connection to the People's Liberation Army. And those facts were probably correct in the sense that most Chinese universities have some sort of relationship, some sort of connection with the People's Liberation Army, just as virtually all American universities have a relationship with the Department of Defense. Uh, you know, uh, university researchers, engineers, scientists, technicians of one type or another pursue research. Some of that research is federally funded. Some of that federally funded research is funded via the Department of Defense or other federal level institutions associated with uh, the military or, or, or you know, uh, intelligence communities or things like that. If the same standard were applied to American scholars that the Department of Justice was using in the China initiative, no American scholar would ever be able to study or research or engage with other universities in other parts of the world because virtually all American institutions of higher education get federal funding of one type or another, and most of them get defense funding. So it was a, it was a very, very contrived uh, basis for pursuing these cases. And the facts are that, of course, in many instances, especially the most high profile cases, uh, uh, Tennessee, uh, MIT, uh, Stanford, cases ultimately wound up either simply being dropped or if they did go to trial, they were not able to, to get convictions because they were simply based on these flimsy sort of pretexts. And, and that, uh, that proved to be a very frustrating uh, uh, process. And of course, as you noted, there's there's such a racist component to this. And, uh, uh, you know, there was a lot of pushback from across the academic community. Of course, from the from the Chinese American community, the Asian American community more broadly, because this kind of stuff, even though it was called the China Initiative and targeted Chinese scholars, it, you know, in 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 American popular consciousness, there's often very little discrimination between different uh, East or Southeast Asian populations. So there definitely was was a lot of, of pushback against it, and that's why about a month ago the DOJ, you know, repackaged it and and basically said, oh, the China. China initiative is over. We've discontinued that. That's the Biden administration's effort to kind of whitewash this situation. But the reality is that these investigations are still ongoing. There are still several thousand cases that have been open uh, and, and are not yet resolved. Hopefully they will uh, not be uh, pursued to the point of these kind of ruinous prosecutions that have been been very very uh, problematic for many totally innocent uh, uh, you know scholars uh, who have been uh, trying to contribute to scientific knowledge that'll be of benefit to America and uh, you know and and probably to the to the wider world as well but these are these are often scholars working in open source publishing uh, where their information there's nothing classified or clandestine about any of it it all came down to these little details of, of technicalities on on forms that were filled out where people didn't even really understand what the issues and what the questions were uh, that uh, that have given rise to these uh, to these persecutions yeah I mean it really, is 
almost like this institutional example of new, of McCarthyism, of a new McCarthyism. It all of the cases that have made headlines, uh, they all indicate that there was a real witch hunt of of just academics. I mean, these were not professors. These were these were not people in various industries who were trading secrets of various inventions or whatnot. That wasn't what they were investigating. Th these were academics who were doing academic research who either just happened to have affiliations with China or just happened to not report based on the fact that you don't have to report on certain grant applications, what your connections are with other institutions. They just happened not to report that and the FBI would flag them and then terrorize them. I mean, a lot like Gang Chen talks about the MIT researcher. He talks about how his family uh, how, uh, was terrorized. They were interrogated by the FBI, how his house was raided. You know, these experiences that are not just traumatic and send a real chilling, I think, message to just people of Chinese descent, the Asian Americans as a whole, sends a real chilling message in the academy, too, of uh, what you are allowed to and not allowed to do in relation to what happens to be a mecca, China, a mecca of research and development, a mecca of innovation, right? So there is a lot, I think, of just intimidation involved in this, which feels like, I mean, a lot of people, I think, right now are thinking about this new Cold War as something that's almost extrajudicial or not Really, it's like an idea more so than it is an institutional framework. But the DOJ's China initiative really showed that this is an institutional, pro like the new Cold War, McCarthyism, tr attempting to use China as a mechanism for repression. I mean, that's that's policy. And this is, I think, an indicator of that. Absolutely. And, and, and the China initiative, you know, that had a very specific... Uh, uh, focus and content looking at uh, researchers, scholars, scientists who had in one way or another either were Chinese from Chinese institutions who had come to American research institutions or in some instances American scholars, scholars uh, who were American citizens, whether of Chinese ancestry or other uh, uh, ancestry, who worked on programs that uh, uh, that uh, were at least in part or even sometimes in, in whole uh, funded by or connected to, to Chinese institutions. Uh, so there was, that was a very specific kind of, uh, of focus for the, for the China initiative. But this is part of a broader effort on the part of, of the American government to, to disrupt and if possible stall uh, China's development, China's uh, economic uh, growth, China's emergence as a significant participant in global affairs, and to to sort of send a very negative message about China to the American people. The idea of of sort of demonizing China, and this goes on. It's a it's a broad spectrum approach, uh, which is why your 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 analogy of of the McCarthy period is uh, is certainly very on the money. Um, of trying to undermine uh, relationships between the United States and China, between any American people and and China. Um, another another dimension of this, another initiative that has been pursued over the last few years, has been the systematic uh, assault on, and in many instances, the the uh, the shutting down of the Confucius Institute program. The Confucius Institutes, this was a program of cooperation, collaboration between institutions of higher education in China and universities and colleges here in the United States to provide resources, including uh, instructors, to teach Chinese language. So it, it, it's basically a Chinese language program. And we had one here at New Mexico State. Uh, I was uh, uh, founding director of that and co-director for, for about seven years. And it, we brought in teachers from China. We worked with the local public schools. We offered courses on campus. We helped uh, our, our sister university down in El Paso, Texas, get a program going. And it was very, very successful. We had thousands of students here in southern New Mexico 
which is a, a poor part of a poor state in, in this part of the country, um, having educational opportunities that they never otherwise would have had. But two years ago, uh, also as part of the Trump administration's uh, uh, anti-China uh, initiatives, the Department of Defense informed a number of universities, including NMSU here, that, uh, that uh, they could certainly go on uh, uh, running their Confucius Institute and receiving the support that they got for that from China, which was a matter of perhaps $100,000 a year, or they could continue to receive the tens of millions of dollars a year in research funding from the Department of Defense. Well, of course, the university administrators, even had they not been predisposed against the Confucius Institutes, uh, you know, they weren't going to they weren't going to sacrifice tens of millions of, of DOD dollars uh, to maintain the Chinese language program. So they shut it down. Public programming, the public schools, the university, students who had spent two or three years beginning their Chinese language studies, everything was simply cut off. Uh, and, and there's been no... Um, no real follow-up, no way to, to provide continuity for those students who had started studying the language. It was a very, very frustrating uh, experience. And it was a clear, clear case of government censorship, of government interference in, in what supposedly is our sacrosanct values of academic freedom in the name of this political rivalry, this political challenge to, to China's development. Uh, and of course, there have been, you know, just the, the, the mass media campaigns against China, the, the lies and distortions that get put out about China virtually every day. It's all, you know, it, these things aren't isolated phenomena that somehow reflect some, uh, some underlying reality, but they're part exactly, as you say, of a policy. Uh, an orientation, uh, a hostility, a new Cold War, a new McCarthyism directed against China that's been in place at least since Obama announced the pivot to Asia back in 2011. Yeah, yes, definitely, definitely. It, it, I feel like the China initiative is like the spawn of a lot of policies, this slow rolling but rapidly developing policy orientation towards China. It's a containment policy. It's a new Cold War orientation. It has at its core the desire to weaken China and also to weaken any kind of alternative that emerges to U.S. unipolarity, to U.S. hegemony and imperialism worldwide. The China initiative had as its mission, no matter how far it veered from it, because its mission, I think, and a lot of the mainstream commentators will say, yeah, veered from the mission, but the mission is actually just, right? We have to stop the Chinese from stealing all of our stuff. Right. Uh, but at the end of the day, the mission was always bankrupt because that the whole basis for it has no, uh, there's no uh, basis for it in reality, right? All It's just allegations. It's all about fear mongering that uh, China is getting ahead because it's cheating, right? It's right. this soft racism, soft yellow peril kind of, uh, propaganda that we have heard over and over and over again for the last, I, I, it, it really has been a decade, but it went fever pitch, I feel, uh, uh, you know, during the Trump era and, and still in the Biden era. And uh, before we move on, I want to let, uh, there's an interesting article that we can comment on one of these cases, because I think it's very interesting uh, to get an example of how this worked. So Jeremy Kuzmarov is a, a great journalist, and I'm not going to read the whole article, but there is one section. So he wrote early this year about how the FBI is recklessly misusing this Trump era espionage policy to create a climate of fear among scientists. He's talking about the China initiative. And to end the article, I mean, he has many examples of this, but I want to talk about one that's still ongoing, actually, that he mentions, which is Fang Tao. Franklin mm -hmm, Tao. Mm -hmm. uh, he's the tenured university. At, he's a tenured professor at the University of Kansas. And so two years ago in 2020, he was charged by the federal government, by the DOJ of concealing that he was a full time professor at China's Fuzhou University and that he received money from a Chinese government talent recruitment program. And so his rep, his lawyer, Peter Zeidenberg, uh, filed a motion about this and it was reported in the New York and uh, in the Washington Post. And they allege that the FBI agent on the case, uh, Stephen Lamp, 
knowingly used false information from an informant to obtain warrants to search Tao's emails, computers, home, and office. So there is this uh, uh, possibility that this is, and a high possibility, given that the majority of these cases fall within this realm, that this was completely trumped up against him. And so uh, Zeidenberg, right, uh, in the motion said that the informant was a researcher who sought to frame Tao as a Chinese tech spy in retaliation for what she saw as a snub by Tao, giving her sufficient credit for not giving her sufficient credit for contributions to a scientific paper for which she felt she was owed $310,000. And that she created fictitious email addresses, three of them, submitted complaints and occasionally slipped up during these complaints, signing an email purporting to be from one researcher with the name of the other and actually sent an email from one of these fake accounts signed with her real name. So there was a real campaign to frame Tao. And uh, they did not inform the court when imp of, uh, applying for the warrant against him, even though the FBI knew about all of these issues. So this is just one, and this is case is still going on. It has not been dismissed like right. the Don Chen case. So this is just one example. And there are literally thousands of these cases. I mean, thousands of these warrants of these uh, charges were sent to various academics. 90% of them are of Chinese descent or Chinese American descent. Many of them have left the country because uh, they felt that they were now no longer welcomed in the United States, right? Fueling this racism. So any reactions to this case, uh, uh, Ken, that you have? Before we well, there's uh, interestingly, there's also a, there's a, a lengthy article in the current issue of The New Yorker also on uh, on Tao Feng's case, uh, which which uh, clarifies or, or, or also sets out uh, the, the details of, of that that frame up uh, and and the the really vicious uh, efforts of this uh, this clearly uh, uh, frustrated but also perhaps otherwise troubled uh, 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 individual who sent these messages to the FBI denouncing Tal and, uh, uh, you know, uh, used false names, false accounts, but also was was obviously not not very functional or sophisticated about this signing her own name to some of these messages, which purported to be from someone else. Uh, all of that unraveled fairly quickly. But exactly as, as you just noted, the FBI did not go public with that. They didn't admit that. They didn't even inform the judges in these in these cases that uh, that these kinds of problems had cropped up. They I guess they thought they would just paper it over and, and go forward. So these are clearly tainted cases that have led to tainted prosecutions. Uh, and, and clearly, uh, uh, Tao Feng's case is, is not an isolated instance. Uh, it reflects really the political purpose of the China initiative. Uh, it's not about national security. It's not about uh, uh, stopping uh, uh, some rampant campaign of industrial espionage. It's about demonizing Chinese and creating exactly, as you said, an atmosphere, a climate of fear uh, within academia. And I'm sorry to say uh, that it has had a certain effect. I know that I've spoken with um, especially Chinese graduate students who are here in the United States working on doctoral programs in, in various scientific uh, uh, disciplines. Uh, I've spoken to them in, in Boston, here in New Mexico, in San Francisco, uh, and, and in, a, in a few other uh, uh, situations. And, and they, are, they are frightened. They are, they are intimidated. So in some ways, you know, the, the China initiative, even though it has had to be repackaged and, and perhaps slightly toned down, uh, has, has achieved the political objectives, uh, some of the political objectives that it's set out for. And I think that, that that's, that's shameful on the part of the American government. Uh, and and I'm I'm very pleased that uh, journalists are are ex exposing some of this, but I think that it's something that uh, that most American people uh, need to be made more aware of. And I hope that as these cases continue to fall apart, and that does at least get reported in in the media, that people will will begin to question uh, just exactly what the underlying motives for something like this really are. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And I feel like the 
attention that is received has been kind of heating up now that and intensifying now that the program was addressed by the Biden administration. And it has put a lot of these higher profile cases, at least uh, on the radar of the mainstream media. And I think one of the reasons for that is that there is this tension, right? Because on the one hand, this program, this campaign of repression has so many useful purposes for this new Cold War, which had as one of its rallying cries, this kind of like decoupling uh, narrative, right? That the United right. States was going to decouple from China. It was <laughs> preposterous in so many ways. It, it, but the tension with that is that China is a huge player. I mean, just in the arena alone of the very areas of which these scientists and researchers work within, the idea of continuing a campaign like this is this is like what a lot of people are saying about the United States with sanctions on Russia, right? It's like shooting yourself in the foot because a lot of the innovation and the growth and the development scientifically, a lot of these researchers were doing work around environmental policy and nanotechnology and all of these things that are going to benefit humanity in the long run. This campaign is basically arresting the capacity of the United States to do that and turning away a, a part of the world, which is a large part of the world, which uh, is providing a lot of the guidance and the knowledge and the understanding and and, and literally the deve actual development of these things that uh, the United States has shown less interest in doing itself. So, yeah, I mean, uh, how do you feel that this policy is contradictory in this way? Well, it's 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 contradictory in the way that that America's approach to to China overall is is contradictory and 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 self defeating, and and in some ways self destructive. I mean, what's going on? You know, not not to not to drop back too much or go too deep, but 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 what's going on in the world today is a, a fundamental restructuring. Of, of economic and geopolitical relationships, you know, for for a long period from the from the rise of the industrial revolution in the early 19th century through the great European colonial era, all the way down to the middle of the 20th century, the monopoly on industrial productive technologies that was retained by basically Western Europe and North America gave that part of the world. Uh, a, a dominant place in in global relationships, the, the 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 Bolshevik Revolution, the rise of the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union's own independent course of industrialization and development, began a process which, as decolonization took place, you know, uh, as as things like the Chinese Revolution, Indian independence, African liberation movements, as these things developed, and a post-colonial world began to emerge, those advanced industrial productive technologies began to disperse around the world. And what that has meant is that, that the United States and, 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 and the great industrial powers of, of Western Europe no longer have a, a, a dominant position in, in, in the production of goods, in, in economic activity. And now, you know, over the last 40 years, basically, a country like China has been very successful, uh, uh, very ambitious, but very successful in those ambitions in developing its economy, in developing its research and development capacities, in modernizing its technologies, and has now been able to position itself in a very strong uh, a place in terms of, of future development, future innovation, future creativity. It seems to me that what that represents is a great opportunity for people all around the world, including people here in the United States. This is a period where we have great challenges, global warming, climate change, uh, environmental degradation in, in, uh, as, a, as a complex of things, finding new kinds of energy regimes, uh, addressing issues of poverty and inequality and racism and injustice, all these things that, that have, have lingered and, and been somewhat intractable. This is a moment where the opportunities for development, the opportunities to enhance the quality of human life around the world, it's a great moment for that.
And what we should be doing, what our government should be doing, what our business leaders should be doing is trying to find the ways in which American businesses, American industries, the American government, American academia can participate in a creative, constructive, meaningful way in this process. But instead, our political and economic elites fearful of forfeiting the positions of dominance and hegemony they've maintained since World War II are kind of circling the wagons and, and trying to adopt this, what can only be a rear guard defensive activity of trying to thwart China's rise, trying to thwart the development of the Chinese economy uh, and, and calling it you know, demonizing China, saying that, oh, they're the, they're destabilizing things. They're a threat. They're expansionist. They want to take over the world, which is about as far from, from the truth as, as, you know, one could reasonably hope to get. Um, but instead of, you know, finding ways to cooperate and, and seek a common future, a better future for everybody, American elites are trying desperately to hang on to their power and their privileges. And that's a very dangerous. It's doomed, but it's also very dangerous along the way because it, it leads to things like the war uh, in Ukraine right now, this push of NATO to the east, this push to menace Russia, try to split Russia away, force Russia back into some subordinate position under American hegemony. That's dangerous. The idea of, of American provocations in the South China Sea or the Taiwan Strait, clandestine activities in, in, in Hong Kong, things like that. These are very dangerous undertakings. Their goal is to weaken and slow down China, but the risk is that they're going to lead to serious confrontation, conflict, whether it's economic or, God forbid, you know, military, that would be devastating for everybody concerned. It would be devastating for the American people. It would be devastating for Americans as consumers, let alone for the Chinese people, uh, you know, where, where, where this sort of thing would be, would be fought out on the, on the ground. So American elites need to get with the program get with the history you know their 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 secretary of state blinken tries to denounce china for being on the wrong side of history it's the american elites that are on the wrong side of history they need to figure out what the historical trend is in our period and how to make the best of it not how to try to stop it these changes are coming they're not going to be stopped and the question is how can we make a positive uh contribution to this process rather than trying to to hold back the tide yeah, I mean, what's always so interesting about analyzing this these last several decades of development, right, especially China's rise, is that what China did was it cooperated with the entire world, right, uh, many neighbors, really, but really the entire world to help gain this capacity. I mean, China was a very poor, very rural-based economy for a very long time, still is in some respects, but because it was able to partner and gain the know-how, the understanding, the experience through cooperation, investment, joint ventures, that sort of thing, it has been able to become a leader in high tech, in 5G technology, renewable energy, AI, artificial intelligence. I mean, it 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 is now in the lead, and that's not that's not going to change because the only way that a country like the United States or even Europe catches up is through cooperation because that's how China did. That's the only possible way that you can develop uh, once uh, there are advancements made outside of your sphere. If you don't have the know-how, the experience, the technology, any, you have to now cooperate to uh, to get it. That's that's kind of the trend worldwide. But to cooperate right with China as an equal or even perhaps as the number two is just so anathema to, as you said, the American elites, they see that because they're, vir they're, vir they're virulently racist. They believe that China should be an open market for them under their control. And the, the more and more that the global trend moves toward cooperation in order to better the lives of humanity, the more and more these elites double down, it seems like. I mean, they're even trying to demand Washington, the, uh, the imperialists, they're trying to demand that China mediate the Russia-Ukraine conflict for the United States. I mean, it's getting absurd. And 
there's all sorts of, I feel like it's like pearl clutching over this idea of the longer and longer that this happens, the more that China rises, the more that real sovereignty around currency and just economic development overall uh, begins to take shape in just more and more massive uh, kinds of ways. So, so it really is a monumental moment. And, and these elites, right, that are just, they're dictated by this uh, voracious and just uh, unrepentant uh, lust for capital. Like they, they, they see China as a quote unquote threat, like the China threat. I always say there is no threat to us, but for, for those who are viewing China as this ultra competitor, this enemy, uh, indeed, they have identified a, a quote unquote threat uh, to their continued preeminence uh, in, in the world system and their dominance over the world system. Yeah. And, and, and again, that's a, that's, you know, it, it's, it's a, it's a basic economic process. It's a process of technological diffusion. It's a process of economic development. Uh, no people in the world are going to, to willfully choose not to take a path of improving their lives. Uh, you know, uh, the idea that that I, I don't know what American elites think. I guess the Chinese were, were supposed to just, you know, uh, stay in the countryside and, and, and work in the in the rice fields and, and you know, be content to uh, uh, provide uh, profits for American businesses. But uh, but, you know, live some sort of minimalist lifestyle out there. Of course, the Chinese want to have a better life. Uh, and and, you know, there's there's challenges and questions in that in terms of resources resource consumption and all that. But they're very cognizant of these. They're, you know, they're world leaders in, in renewable energy. They're making sincere efforts, very clear, strong efforts to address environmental issues in the country, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in, in, and uh, while still trying to, to develop and, and, uh, you know, lift people out of poverty and enhance the livelihoods of, uh, of the population. So it's, it's a huge challenge for China. And the idea that somehow the United States, which has absorbed resources from around the world, uh, you know, has has inflated its own lifestyle uh, based upon the extraction of wealth from working people around the planet, uh, that the United States is going to dictate the terms to China or really to anyone else. Uh, it's it's and and then do so in the name of some kind of rules based order or some kind of you know democratic uh, value system. It's just it's just such gross and blatant hypocrisy. Uh, it's, it's 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 appalling. Uh, but it also requires, obviously, that uh, that that we push back and that we fight back against that. And uh, as the Chinese themselves like to say, seek truth from facts and not just accept these these propaganda campaigns of demonization uh, as if as if, you know, there, there's no way to question that there there is. Uh, and it doesn't take much. You know, you just have to have to acquaint yourself with what the realities are that are out there. Yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. And. What's interesting about what we're talking about, too, is that under this broad campaign against China, right, it, it, the China Initiative falls, there was this hope, I think, among some that Joe Biden's administration would represent some kind of relief from this new Cold War, some kind of pivot back to a semblance of cooperation out of maybe even just economic necessity. Uh, maybe because Donald Trump's anti-China campaign, especially around COVID-19, is is a real public relations blunder. It really did hurt the prestige of the United States and how it looks within this quote-unquote uh, rules-based international order that it says it's in the lead of. Uh, but what I always find interesting about Democratic Party administrations is that the change that occurs is generally... Uh, surface level. It's generally around framing and public relations. It's not generally a huge change in terms of policy. Of course, there are policy differences, but in these questions, on these questions of foreign policy, generally the change is just how war is talked about, how the new Cold War is talked about, right? Instead of uh, uh, Trump saying it's the China virus, it's Joe Biden saying, no, China is an autocracy that we're in competition with. And here's why we need to uh, investigate China for COVID-19 origins. Here's why we need to, uh, you know, pass the America Competes Act and send all kinds of weapons to Taiwan. 
it's because we're in competition, it's an autocracy, and it's trying to spread authoritarian, right? It's this, this different framing, uh, but the policies are similar. And I want to just pull up really quickly before we move on uh, exactly what we're talking about in relation to the China initiative and how this has been reframed, because it hasn't been, it's been formally ended as the China initiative as it was known under the Trump administration. But rather than the program just being scrubbed from existence, rather than the campaign being scrubbed from existence, actually what has happened is there's been a huge remarketing campaign of this program to countering uh, nation state threats, multiple threats. And so how uh, the assistant attorney general, uh, Matthew Olson at, at the DOJ, uh, what he says is that this new strategy is focusing not just on China, but the big four actors, Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran. So this program, which is uh, ostensibly about cyber espionage and uh, tech secrets and the stealing of information technology and other things, this program is actually expanded now. It is actually right. meant to now, <laughs> now include Iran, Russia and the DPRK so conveniently in order to, and China still, to continue this campaign. Now it's just not framed as, now there's an acknowledgement that academics and those who maybe shouldn't have been investigated were caught in this web. And now they're going to do it correctly by going after the real threats, right? The actual uh, threats to so-called national security and economic development. Well, it's funny that uh, that uh, the big four, you know, it's basically just a repackaging, an expanded version, but a repackaging of the old Bush administration's axis of evil uh, rhetoric, you know, uh, and this idea, uh, you know, it, it, it's the United States needs to to have this very Manichaean worldview that uh, that you're either for us or you're against us there's no there's no room for people to to sort of you know pursue their own national interests or or follow their own autonomous uh, uh, trajectories you are either part of the american hegemonic block or we're going to get you you know uh, uh and and that's reflected you know in the rhetoric that we're seeing Again, uh, in in the context of uh, of the conflict in Ukraine right now, that that American politicians and and uh, American media pundits are are harping on this idea that uh, this is a great moment for the Biden administration because President Biden has has reinvigorated the American led alliance. He has united. You know, uh, and again, to a drudging up old free world rhetoric, united the or old Cold War rhetoric. The old, he's reunited the free world under American leadership and all this, which again just contravenes the the facts of reality. Because if you look at the countries, for example, within the United Nations that voted against or abstained from these uh, these American sponsored uh, resolutions, they actually constitute a majority of people on Earth. Uh, numerically, because some of the countries are so big, they're not the majority of states, but they are the majority of people. And of course, people are really what what should matter, right? So we have this this effort to to create a sort of demonized block: China, Russia, Iran, DPRK. Um, but also this this sort of uh, false claim that uh, all the good guys are united, you know, behind us, under our leadership. Once again, what a great moment of, of revival for American leadership. And it's it's just nonsense. You know, uh, uh, it doesn't reflect uh, the, the realities of the world. It doesn't reflect the needs, the wishes, the hopes of, of the majority of people on the planet. Uh, and it's just uh, it's just a, a, a repack a rhetorical effort to to validate uh, and and uh, and advance the, the this this program of hanging on to American uh, preeminence, hanging on to American dominance. Yeah, no, that's that's definitely true. And right now we're in this world historic moment of the Russia Ukraine conflict war, and uh, this what you described has has only intensified like now there is this attempt to kind of create this axis of evil and uh, with russia 
uh, intervening in Ukraine has become almost the, like the center of the evil. And now China it has been blamed, right, for not doing something about this, for not uh, attempting because China and Russia are so close. Now they'll acknowledge this as being something that might have some utility. They say, OK, uh, Washington, the Department of State, the entire establishment is saying the NATO establishment, all of them, they're saying, yes, China is to blame for this. They could easily right? They could easily mediate this. They deflect everything onto China. Right. And the fact is that NATO could have ended this conflict a long time. It could have ended it before it started, because before it started in December, uh, Russia, Vladimir Putin, they were demanding, they were saying, hey, for this to, for this escalation to be, you know, to uh, be reversed, for us to really de-escalate, we have certain conditions. And one of them, was, uh, one of the big one, I really at the top of the list was NATO expansion has to stop and it has to stop uh, uh, now before Ukraine is ever considered right. to be admitted. And, and that was just denied and rejected. And Joe Biden right, had this supposed phone call with Putin in January and, and took it with the uh, usual imperial hubris, right? Saying, I spoke to him and, you know, nothing doing. And, and so there is so much projection onto China of all of the, uh, these shortcomings, but really just these examples of how the United States, with its position in the world still being unipolar, still being hegemonic, is really at the root cause of a lot of these problems that we see in the world that you described the poverty the war and now with russia and ukraine I, there is this attempt because the united states isn't supposedly directly involved and it, there is this attempt to frame the world situation as well russia is this belligerent that and china is this uh, sort of accomplice and uh, the united states is acting with the best of intentions and the best uh, that the world has to offer and that NATO is a peace force and you have everyone calling for you. you have a lot of people calling for no fly zones, close this, close the skies. It's a real, I think, harrowing moment uh, yes. in, in history. Uh, but at the same time, this multipolar, right, pluripolar world that's developing, this alternative is rapidly occurring. And so I want, could you speak to that? Because I know that there have been so many developments around currency lately, right? The ruble is actually doing pretty well right now uh, in relationship to these sanctions. Russia has hardened its stance on its own currency, is moving uh, toward uh, de de really demanding, has already demanded the EU pay for gas in rubles, right? The EU is still paying for gas. It's still getting gas from Russia despite these sanctions because to turn off the spigot 100% would like literally cause the European economy to crash. So there's, I think, a lot of contradictions here, but also some really interesting developments. So could you speak to that and where China fits into this, uh, I guess, emerging multipolar employee polar world that's occurring? Sure, sure. Uh, you know, some of this is 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 very clearly bound up with the current uh, the current geopolitical situation. Uh, uh, obviously, the 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 sanction regime, the 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 you know what the United States likes almost more than anything else is to go around imposing sanctions on other countries, even though they've been clearly demonstrated over the years not to achieve the objectives that they're stated to be uh, aimed at, uh, and in fact, if anything, hurt ordinary people much more than the ostensible targets. But uh, China has always opposed uh, and continues to oppose that sanctions regime, uh, but they understand that that that's a a, a key component of America's uh, sort of strategic uh, arsenal, and uh, not only for that reason, but that is certainly one reason. China has been working to develop um, institutions and systems of international economic development and cooperation uh, that that are going to be out from under. Uh, the control of the United States or American dominated institutions like the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund. Um, one of the things they've done, of course, uh, one of the sanctions that the United States has uh, uh, imposed on, on Russia right now has to do with the SWIFT system which is the, the interbank system for the settlement of international payments. 
the SWIFT system, all transactions in the SWIFT system have to pass through New York, and that gives the United States the ability to, to disrupt them, to intervene in that, uh, in that uh, uh, financial operation in ways that allow them to, to impose these sanctions. Well, China is now trying to develop its own uh, uh, independent system of international payments, the CIPS system. Um, that would allow countries uh, to to engage in trade and settle their contractual mutual obligations without going through uh, American uh, territory, without going uh, through a, a, a point of vulnerability where the American government can intervene and and impose its will upon them. Well, of course, you know the United States sees that. Uh, as uh, as terrible, you know, because it it weakens the ability of the United States to dominate uh, other countries. On a, on of course on, on on probably the grandest scale, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, which has been going on, uh, you know, for the last uh, nine years or so, uh, is is designed to help. Uh, countries develop their their domestic infrastructure, their international trade systems, ports, airports, roadways, uh, some productive facilities, other things like this, pipelines, energy systems. This is a huge enterprise, a huge endeavor. It's not something China is doing philanthropically. It's mutually beneficial. China will will reap benefits from the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, they're not just doing it out of the goodness of their heart, but they're doing it in ways that will that will uh, allow countries around the world to to develop their economies. As those countries become more productive and more prosperous, China will share in that prosperity as those countries are sharing in China's growing prosperity now. That too is a system which is designed and, and functions uh, independently of, of American oversight and American dominance. And again, that's, that's anathema to, to the American economic and political elites. They want to maintain the system of control that has enriched them and made them so powerful in the world uh, you know, since, uh, since the era of World War II. So, you know, it, it's certainly true that China has has self-consciously, but also totally above board. They've been very clear, very overt about about what they're doing. They want to encourage the development of a multicentric, polycentric world that isn't just dominated by one superpower that that sets the rules. When when Blinken talks about the international rules based order, what he means is the international order based on our rules. Uh, and and China doesn't want that. China does not want that. China is not creating a system which will impose their rules on everybody, but they're giving people the opportunity to participate in, in international financial and economic operations, which are I immune from, isolated from, insulated from uh, American domination. So whether that's that's uh, uh, the international payment system or the Belt and Road Initiative or, uh, you know, uh, helping to facilitate ruble transfers. You know, India, which, of course, like China, is abstaining from condemning Russia, is abstaining from uh, uh, these votes in the United Nations. India has just made uh, uh, some very significant oil purchases from Russia. And uh, and they've worked out a deal where that's going to be settled through a, a rupees and rubles exchange. Uh, you know, we don't see hysterical headlines about that in in uh, the mainstream media because India, of course, is uh, is, you know, the world's biggest democracy and and otherwise supposed to be uh, a little uh, a little closer to the United States. Only China gets singled out for condemnation for this stuff, even though, you know, India, Pakistan, Brazil, South Africa, many other countries uh, are, are taking part in these efforts to get themselves out from under the thumb of American imperialism and American domination. Right. I mean, at this point, and, and I think China recognizes this, especially in the, the South or the what's called the global South, is that no matter what the governance system, no matter what the political problems and conflicts and issues that occur within any given country that there is this trend of south-south cooperation that's almost a requirement for the uh, what is a un you know principle it's enshrined uh by the geneva conventions it's this right to development this right to just exist and to uh, have the sovereignty economically politically 
etc to chart your own course for development and uh, almost at i guess the most basic tenet of china's approach to world affairs is that is that the right to develop exists with all of these countries and so china is going to encourage that by offering uh what it has at its disposal to facilitate it and and uh, one of the interesting things that's happened during the sanctions regime is that there is this, I think, a growing understanding around the world that China kind of serves as a model of what it means to develop your country in a way that uh, if Russia has been able to restructure and make itself relatively protected from sanctions, China has become an economy that is almost sanctions proof because it's paid attention to its domestic development as well as integrated integrated itself worldwide. And so that provides many layers of protection from uh, despite all the economic conflagrations and issues that come with the hostilities of the United States and its and the global economy's just overall instability. China has been relatively protected and has been able to keep on its own trajectory and at the same time and I think that this is a historic achievement at the same time, make itself and present itself in a very peaceful manner uh, as a uh, a player in world affairs, as, as, as a country that is not isolationist and that champions globalization. Right. I think it is it's a very interesting phenomenon. And I think it really provides a lot of motivation to the Pompeos of the world and even to the Bidens and the Blinkens of the world to create initiatives like the China Initiative to try to stop this, to try to arrest yeah. this and shoot itself in the foot while doing it. Shoot, shoot, them, they shoot all, they all shoot themselves in the foot uh, trying to do this uh, because the U.S. stature does not, it's not gaining any more preeminence. It's not right. uh, gaining any more legitimacy. Out of any yeah, of I, I think that, I think that, that you touch on, on, on some really important uh, uh, points there. Um, one of the things that, that, China gets uh, uh, condemned for routinely in, in Western media is this idea of, of sort of coddling dictators or something like that. Uh, and what that, what that, uh, the, 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 the thin basis that, that that's premised upon is the idea that China does not impose political conditions on its development assistance. They don't have a checklist. They don't have a, an agenda like the World Bank or the IMF or the United States government that says you have to conform to our ideological norms. You have to institutionally conform to our expectations in order for us to provide you with, with assistance. Uh, China you know, is, is, has been since the 1950s committed to the principles of uh, respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity, non-interference in the internal affairs of other countries. And and those are the principles that that underpin something like like the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. And and again, that's something that uh, that the United States uh, obviously uh, does not follow. And they find that to be uh, they find that to be very threatening. So uh, I think that what that what that relates to in part, though. Uh, and again, this is something you just touched on, is this idea of, of modeling, of serving as a model. China doesn't try to impose its political system, its economic order, its way of life on other countries. But China recognizes that its very success lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, weathering the COVID disasters with, with 5,000, fewer than 5,000 deaths out of 1.4 billion people, while the U.S. has passed a million dead, uh, taking care of its working population during the 2008 financial crisis. One thing after another, after another, where China, because of its socialist system, because of its its commitment to to improving and and caring for the lives of its people china has achieved a, a, a great deal of, of progress and success in economic and social development that serves that can serve as an inspiration not necessarily as a as a, a blueprint or a template or a cookie cutter but as a as an inspiration of the kinds of policies the kinds of political orientation the kinds of political culture that other countries might well want to emulate and that's a practice, that's a mentality that goes back deep in Chinese tradition, the idea that all the way back into, into Confucian times and Confucian thoughts that, that, you know, what you do is you, the ruler, should be a model. The individual should be a model. 
live your life properly, fulfill the the values that 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 of integrity and loyalty and principle and all this that that you that you abide by and and become a model for others. Don't force other people, don't compel other people to conform to your norms, but model your behavior, model your life, model your values in a way that other people see as successful and worthy of emulation. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Uh we're running. We're running out of time for the interview. We. I will be on for another fifteen minutes uh, with some a bit more commentary uh, to conclude. But this was great. I thought that this conversation really does lay kind of the scope for understanding where the China Initiative comes from, the context, the history, uh, this struggle that we are caught in right now. We are caught in this new Cold War, and uh, we. I think just. I think you did a great job and it was a great conversation identifying, well, what's the root of that? You know, how, what, what is the root of this aggression, right? Because oftentimes it's China that is blamed. It's China that is targeted. Uh, it's, it's China's allies. It's, it's countries that are non-aligned with U.S. imperialism, which are, are constantly targeted. And, and I think the mission of any peace movement where we reside, uh, you and I, is to is to really speak up about that and to make it a focal point of our activities. So, so this was a great conversation, Ken. Do you have any uh, parting thoughts, anything you want to uh, promote? Well, just, uh, you know, I, I hope that uh, that people who are listening will, you know, continue to pursue these ideas, these questions on their own. Uh, again, it's not our job to, to tell people what to think. It's our job to make information available, talk about how we see things. Uh, but I, I certainly encourage everyone to, to seek truth from facts, try to try to learn what you can about China, about the world. And and, uh, you know, when. Uh, when things look like they need to be addressed, uh, to address them and and to work for peace and work for understanding and friendship between people, uh, not just in China and the United States, but but really working people all around the world. Well, uh, thank you so much, Ken, for coming. I, I think that's a great message to end on for this conversation. Uh, we'll have to have you back on again very soon. Uh, so take care and have a good day. Uh, evening yeah i would be i would be delighted to come back and chat anytime all right uh, take care <laughs> take care now so stick around i'm going to be on for another 10 15 minutes uh thanks so much for coming make sure you like this stream make sure you subscribe to the channel all that good stuff continue to share it and i just wanted to conclude on a more broader analysis of this repression, right? Because that's what we're talking about with the China Initiative. We're talking about state repression, we're talking about a neo McCarthyite campaign, a Cold War campaign to target those who are deemed to be a criminal elements in society. So, of these scientists, these researchers, mainly of Chinese descent, they are seen as a threat, uh, as a convenient target because to the racist and imperialist uh, security forces, uh, they represent this uh, progress that China is making, right? So any presence of even Chinese scientists in this kind of climate becomes a threat to the empire. And so that's why you have something like the China Initiative. Uh, but we have to also, I think, place this in the context of just the longer campaign of repression. I mean, of course, we can go back all the way to the origins of the United States, where security forces, whether they were militias, whether uh, they were sort of more official uh, security forces, the first police forces, right? All of them were geared towards repressing resistance, the resistance of indigenous people, the resistance of African slaves, the resistance of workers, working class people, right? These security forces have as their very origins in the United States, uh, an apparatus meant to control and maintain class antagonism, right? There is a class antagonism that is inherent under the U.S.'s way of life, under this U.S. imperialist system, and that is what the police, that is what any kind of security force under this system is really geared toward and it is all about. It. That's what its purpose is. So this includes the FBI and how uh, I don't think we need a whole history lesson of how the Federal Bureau of Investigation at its very core, was founded on these Cold War principles, right, to kind of maintain and repress, really repress any kind of working class struggle uh, in service of uh, capital. 
And there's, of course, the high profile uh, Coento, the counterintelligence program under the FBI, the McCarthyist uh, spying campaigns, right? The trumping up charges, targeting uh, black leftists, black communists, com the Communist Party of USA, right? These campaigns of infiltration among the entire movement under the umbrella of Marxism that has occurred. Uh, the FBI has played its role in uh, really suppressing the radical and revolutionary potential that exists in the United States. And there's a really great doc doctoral paper. You can find it on Google. Uh, I can share it. I've shared it on my Patreon. I've shared it uh, in the past that Huey P. Newton wrote. Uh, the uh, one of the co-founders of the Black Panther Party. Uh, this was after the Black Panther Party's dissolution. He wrote a doctoral paper on the repression of the Black Panther Party and the history of repression in America. Definitely want to find that because it has a whole analysis and, and really a synthesis of that history, uh, key facts about the development of the FBI, about its campaign against the Black Panther Party. It's a really incredible work. And so no one should be surprised, despite how much these security forces, these intelligence uh, agencies, no matter how much they receive a facelift, they are actually at the root of all of this repression. They are the ones who are facilitating it. And, and they need to be called out as such, even though it's difficult in this climate where, you know, I have myself, Jing Jing Li, there are these journalists that are coming after us. I know that there's a hit piece coming out on me soon. There's already been one out on her. Uh, we've seen all of the censorship and all of that. So it's a real difficult climate, but we still have to do it. We still have to make sure that we place these agencies, their role in the security and state and police apparatus uh, for what it really is. We need to call them out and we need to spread the information uh, that's required to gain a better understanding of all of this. So definitely download that report that, that, uh, you know, I can share it on my Patreon later. I can put it in the show notes as well after uh, the stream ends. But nonetheless, I want to show you all something to kind of conclude, to just show you where the FBI is coming from and the DOJ is coming from when it comes to this China initiative. And here you have this problem of racism, right? We have to talk about it. Racism is a huge part of how these state uh, forces, how these police and security forces, intelligence agencies, how really the state apparatus, this repressive apparatus does its work. It does its work. It uh, suppresses dissent, not on some kind of universalist basis. Racism plays a huge role in the propaganda and in the ideological underpinnings of something like the China Initiative. And so uh, 10 years ago, uh, 2012, right? There was a revelation in an internal inquiry on counterterrorism training that the FBI taught agents that the Bureau has, quote, the ability to bend or suspend the law to impinge on the freedom of others, end quote, and that agents should, quote, never attempt to shake hands with an agent, Asian, and that Arabs were prone to outbursts of a jackal and hide nature. So this is how these forces are trained, right? This goes deep into the very ways in which these forces are trained and how they operate in society. And so we have to just keep that in mind, that when Biden says, Joe Biden says he wants to fund police more, when the squad gives more money to federal law enforcement, Joe Biden just did in the recent budget that he's requesting as well, an $800 billion military budget, which includes more money for federal law enforcement. When you hear more funding for police security forces, the military, you should think about racism and you should think about violence because that's what it is, right? Not only are these wars justified on the most vile racism, look at how Russia has been portrayed in contradistinction to Ukraine. Look at how Ukraine has been portrayed as this blonde-haired, blue-eyed country in contradistinction to the Arab world, the so-called Muslim world, uh, Syria, Afghanistan, etc. Uh, it has been this whole civilization versus barbarism narrative, which fuels 
the propaganda apparatus, the propaganda war, but it also fuels the repressive apparatus as well, the state apparatus. The United States government is built upon the most vile of racism, and the FBI is trained in that racism. And you should believe and better believe that this includes all security forces are trained in this way. There's a lot of evidence about how the NYPD and other police departments are trained in order to detect threats that are very, uh, you could just say racially biased, but really just racist in character. Uh, we know this from the disproportionate killings, from all of the high profile cases from Amadou Diallo all the way to uh, 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 Dante Wright. You know, these cases that show just how black people are targeted by police at a rate much higher than white people. So we have to understand that training is the problem, more funding is the problem, and that any calls for an increase in funding is really an existential threat to the existence of oppressed people and working class people. And, and we need to think about it like that, that these forces are trained to do what they do. Not that they are just bad apples, and I know everyone who watches me doesn't think that the police or the FBI or anything are just bad apples, but even just this notion that it, that it can be reformed in any way, that even if you put a massive amount of investment to reform the system, you put in uh, all kinds of funds to retrain and to reorient these forces, it doesn't matter because their very purpose is to protect capital at our expense. And that means racism is a very convenient and helpful tool to do that. And that's why it's part of the guiding framework of every level of the state's repressive apparatus, from the most local police departments to the intelligence agencies to the Pentagon. Racism is baked into it. And it doesn't matter if they tell you so or not. I mean, these papers, these documents actually said so. This counterintelligence, counterterrorism inquiry actually revealed it. But regardless of whether it's a revelation or whether it's just the reality of the policy, the material reality that uh, exists in the world, uh, we need to think about it like this. So I just wanted to close on that note because I think it's important to remember that these intelligence agencies, the police, the security apparatus, these forces, they are, they are, they are really uh, agents of repression and racism. And it has this overall purpose of reproducing, maintaining this empire domestically and abroad. And so we have to continue to be vigilant about this and not let any kind of trend development uh, as hard as it is, right? Because there are a lot of things that are chilling. The China Initiative is one of them. The tearing down of independent media is another, right? It, this does help facilitate a climate of fear. And we have to support each other and make sure that we are putting out uh, the correct analysis and engaging in real conversation and debate, discourse, and activity that, that, uh, aligns with our principles. So, so you know, we'll, we'll continue to struggle. And, and I think uh, this conversation with uh, uh, Professor Hammond was uh, really illuminating in the sense that it really did provide almost this synopsis, right? It's all, it was almost like a syllabi of how to understand the new Cold War on China and all of its implications from domestic, like the China Initiative, to globally in this move toward a multipolar world. And we will need to continue to engage in this kind of analysis as we, uh, as, as we investigate and understand and continue to be active agents in, in this process. So uh, with that said, everyone, you know, I'll probably be back uh, sometime in the next few days, hopefully, uh, maybe Friday, perhaps. I will be able to jump back on. I will also uh, be working on a few other kind of more guest collaborations that I think are useful. Still have to do a lot of work around uh, getting this uh, channel also protected and moving on to other platforms. So that's coming. I don't know. I, I got caught up in tax season, so I don't know when that's coming exactly. But uh, 
it's coming. And, um, you know, I, uh, I'll, I'll be publishing articles as best I can, and I'll be taking a break sometime next month, mid month. So, uh, I'll, I'll make sure that you all are aware, definitely taking a break soon because I don't know about you all, but I am feeling the burnout and it's necessary to get a break and to keep, um, you know, keep supporting each other and taking care of ourselves as well as we, uh, you know, as we are in this for the long haul. So with that said, everyone keep liking the stream. Keep sharing it. Subscribe to the channel. Hit that bell. Make sure that you're aware of all the upcoming work. And of course, you support this channel and all of my work at patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. That's the best place to do it. And I will be with you all again soon. Uh, and until next time, uh, peace out.